Welcome to Nature Bats Last on the Progressive Radio Network. It's NBL on PRN.FM. This November 3rd, 2020 edition, episode 144 of Nature Bats Last, comes to you mostly live from Central Florida in the United States. This is Guy McPherson, and I'm joined by sometime co-host Pauline Schneider. We have a pre-recorded 15-minute segment featuring Dr. Ye Tao of Harvard's Roland Institute, and we are joined live shortly after that clip runs by artist Ken Avador. We will start with a pre-recorded conversation. Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard University's Roland Institute joins us today. And I have a question or two about the project that you are directing, the MEER project, that's M-E-E-R. First of all, where can we find the MEER project on the internet? Um, so first of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, you can uh, find the MEER Reflection Project by entering www.meerreflection, R-E-F-L-E-C-T-I-O-N.com. That's great. Thank you. And so that provides uh, a web-based home, at least, for the Mere Reflection Project. Now, can you give us an overview of this project, the outline, the timeline, in layperson's terms, how would the mirrors work on land, in the ocean? What's the whole approach here? Yeah, so the approach is uh, to first step back and ask the question of when you have a planetary scale problem, what can we do? to at sufficient scale to address such a gigantic problem. So first of all, we need enough material uh, to make any impact. So we look at Earth and ask, what are the most abundant elements that can be found on Earth? And among the top elements, you find silicon, oxygen, and aluminum. Then uh, we think, basically, we need to uh, focus attention engineering uh, to leveraging these uh, elements. So that's a, a point one where you find the material. The second point is we want to uh, most efficiently address the most urgent problem of facing humanity, which is a planetary overheating. So in essence, we have a certain amount of heat trapped in the atmosphere that allows everything to grow and prosper. If you have too much heat trapped, then it's disaster. You have too little, that's also a disaster for um, a civilization that's uh, uh, accustomed to the current level or pre-industrial level of heat. So heat arrives and leaves. Um, traditionally, um, uh, people tackling climate change have been focusing on trying to open the outlet, uh, the IR radiation, by trying to um, draw down or clean up the atmosphere. Uh, that's a very uh, laborious process and energy intensive process. But you can achieve the same effect by um, closing a bit of the inlet. And that's what uh, Project Mirror Reflection is trying to do by rejecting selected portion of the coming sunlight back into space. So that's how uh, the basic idea. From a conceptual point of view, um, when we're trying to reject light using mirrors, it's a two-dimensional engineering problem because light reflection happens uh, on a two-dimensional plane. That's rather manageable compared to a three-dimensional volume of the atmosphere and the ocean that we need to sift through and filter. So that's a much bigger operation from uh, just engineering uh, practical point of view. So we, first of all, look at the two possible solutions at the inlet versus outlet. We select the one that's most simple conceptually and in practice, the 2D problem rather than the 3D. And then we look for uh, the abundant materials we have on Earth to implement such a strategy, which is to use glass made of silicon and oxygen predominantly and with a thin film of aluminum, uh, we need only 10 to 100 nanometers of aluminum coating to have it basically achieve 80 to 90% reflectivity. Uh, so to give you a sense of how big uh, that is, uh, your cell is probably 10 micrometers. 
uh, and uh, the thickness you need is one hundredth of the thickness of your cell. So by compressing a three-dimensional dimen problem into a 2D problem, we achieve significant cost and the material saving. And this a conceptual uh, leap, I would say, is what makes mirror reflection affordable and scalable. So I've heard some conversation about implementing mirror reflection on the ocean or on land or some combination of the two. So can you walk us through the advantages, disadvantages, where you think this would be best, best applied? Um, that's a very good question and one that we're currently investigating. So uh, mirrors, the simplest one is uh, just a piece of glass you put outside in your backyard laying horizontally. So let's assume we were just to encourage everybody to go to Home Depot or Alibaba.com to buy some mirrors and lay in their backyard and ask the question, where, which country are blessed with the highest efficiency? Um, so it turns out, here's, well, as expected, uh, equatorial regions, um, tropics are better places. Um, but it turns out that the ocean are actually much better um, in general, the reason is the amount of uh, heat or light available for rejection is the difference between what's coming down on the ground minus what is absorbed by the ground or the ocean. So it's this difference. The oceans, um, well, they, uh, they have very low albedo. So um, you get uh, intrinsically like uh, very little light uh, reflected away. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, potential to reject the amount that's normally absorbed by the ocean by putting mirrors in the ocean. Uh, but of course, from a practical point of view, uh, it's much uh, more difficult to make mirrors float in the ocean. So it's a more involved engineering challenge. Um, but you get roughly a factor of two to three improvement in cooling efficiency if we were to implement the mirrors in the uh, oceans uh, compared to if they were just laid out in somebody's backyard up here uh, in, in Boston or mm -hmm. in the Northeast. And how large an area are we talking about here? Because I'm guessing even if it's a relatively big backyard in Boston, one yard is not going to cover it. So how much uh -huh. surface area do we need? And how does that compare with, say, the size of Boston or Massachusetts or whatever? OK, that's a very good question. So uh, calculations show that you need roughly 8 by 8 or to 10 by 10 feet square of mirror, horizontal mirror laid out, um, say, in the, uh, the sunny areas uh, with uh, low background albedo to offset one ton. Uh, of CO2. So that's roughly 100 square feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what's the uh, average roof space per person in the US. It's probably on the order of a couple hundred or a few hundred. So that basically shows if all the roofs uh, or um, backyards were covered, we, we can offset mm -hmm. for on the order of month to years of emissions. So that's certainly not sufficient. So that also shows that um, uh, while the, the concept works, it, it's a, a transition step towards um, moving to mirror enabled um, renewable energy production, which would essentially make further construction unnecessary as the um, amount of emissions go down. So uh, we talked about horizontal mirrors, but it's also possible to increase the efficiency somewhat uh, by tilting the mirrors uh, towards an angle that's more perpendicular to the direction from which the sunlight arrives. Um, so that calculation is ongoing uh, and will lead to a factor of maybe two or three saving in space. Mm -hmm. And are we talking here um, square miles, square kilometers, the size of North America. Give us some some idea uh, for yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Decide. So, so the, uh, the, the area that needs to be uh, covered on an annual basis right now, assume we continue uh, 2019 emission rates, uh, would be the surface area of Belarus. Oh, OK. Per, per year. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and that's to, to compensate for the amount of emissions of emissions that are happening as of 2019. So if we could actually do something like reduce emissions, heaven forbid, yes. then we, so, we might get away with a little bit smaller area. Uh, that's exactly right. So that's why at Mere Reflection, uh, we are very busy developing um, uh, engin engineering technologies, uh, energy production and food production schemes enabled uh, by a large uh, mirror and glass manufacturing capability to um, move toward a carbon neutral uh, economy. Okay, changes in the subject a little bit. Can you explain the difference between mirror reflection and carbon sequestration? Um, yes. So as we mentioned uh, before, to tune how much heat is trapped in earth, we have the outlet and to the inlet to play with. Carbon sequestration is uh, a way to open the outlet by uh, re uh, removing uh, heat trapping gases from the atmosphere. Mirror reflection is a way to do the same thing by closing the inlet. So uh, carbon sequestration um, and mirror reflection can actually work uh, together. And we think uh, mirror reflection can actually enable the most efficient carbon sequestration scheme uh, possible. So carbon sequestration um, uh, works best for uh, concentrated emission sources. For example, uh, coal-fired power, power plants. The reason being that once we allow the CO2 to escape into the atmosphere and freely mix, there is a process called entropic mixing. Uh, basically, it takes work to sort M&Ms of different color, but it's very easy to mix them up. So it takes energy to do the reverse. Uh, calculations show that the amount of energy that humanity needs to invest to reduce atmospheric CO2 concentrations back to safe levels of pre-industrial levels uh, it's roughly, it's more than what the world consumes in a single year, and that's the theoretical number. Any uh, thermodynamic engine or process is never 100% efficient, and uh, our current technology will only enable on the order of 5% efficiency, which means 20 years of world's primary energy consumption is necessary in order to capture CO2 from the air. Uh, and that's a, a huge problem because it's even difficult to even spend 1% or 5% of world's energy primary consumption to do any uh, mitigation efforts, which means we're looking at timescales of centuries if we were to entertain the idea of direct air capture. So that's why um, uh, in terms of carbon capture and sequestration, the only sensible source or emission sources are um, concentrated uh, power plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm. so that's step one. So that's fee fee potentially feasible for power plants. But the problem is once you capture it, where do you put it? And, and that's a common problem facing the field. In the US, for example, I think based on uh, the Drawdown Conference 2019 I attended, we have on the order of 100 megaton of storage space uh, that we know can be utilized. And that's less than 1% of what the world uses per year. So it uh, doesn't seem likely that we will ever be able to find enough storage space even for one year of emission. So as a result, uh, carbon capture storage, while it's possible to capture, it's not really feasible to store. That's why people are looking at ways to turn CO2 into 
solid form, such as uh, by mixing a little bit into concrete or into giant reactors and into rocks. So they uh, undergo geological transformation. The problem with those schemes is that they are not scalable to anywhere near what's necessary, regardless of the amount of investment. Big thanks to Dr. Tao for the conversation, which was recorded last week. Pauline, will you introduce today's guest? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention that uh, the the longer version of that conversation with Dr. Tao will be uh, run either later today or tomorrow on the uh, the NBL YouTube channel. Um, but thank you, Guy, very much for that. We're joined today by American artist Ken Avador. Ken is an illustrator, cartoonist, and occasional courtroom sketch artist. He is an active urban sketcher and maintains a daily illustrated journal. He also posts his video productions on YouTube, where his channel is Bicyclopolis, uh, which is also the title of his first book, published in 2001. He's also uh, found on Instagram. Ken is married to urban cartographer and talented sketch artist Roberta Avador. Ken Avador, welcome to Nature Bats Last on the Progressive Radio Network. How are you today? Thank you, Pauline, and hello, Guy, and uh, it's a real honor to be on NPL. It is great to have you here on this most auspicious of days. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, you posted a cartoon on the first on the first day of this year. It turned out to be quite prescient. Will you describe the airplane cartoon and then tell us how you managed to foresee the ongoing horrors of 2020? Well, I think that was mostly accidental. It just felt like uh, you know, I, I felt something in the zeitgeist, and I drew a picture of a plane labeled 2020 um, heading straight down. Uh, but I think I was a little bit modest. Than what it was really like, it was more like a, a fleet of aircraft plus a whole bunch of Hindenburg Zeppelins and maybe quite a few Titanics as well crashing every day. Yeah, only. <laughs> it, it, it's a good thing you didn't draw alien spacecraft. Next, that will be next. Thank you. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> so you know we were we have loved your cartoons and your graphics for a long time now we've really enjoyed them and you know i was wondering you know how how long ago did you start drawing and just like what inspired you and well the, i guess my origin story would be that uh, i was born in brooklyn new york and uh, my parents whisked me up to the northern suburbs uh, of Westchester, which at that time was cornfields, uh, farms, and, and forests. Uh, so I was on the, uh, the northern shockwave of uh, suburbia, and what I saw around me was uh, you know, just the, I kind of had a Huck Finn adventures in these forests, but they would be turned into the suburbs. Uh, there wasn't very much for me to do there, uh, except watch television, draw pictures, and read. And uh, so that's where it all kind of began. And I was part of that duck and cover generation. Uh, we did do that uh, yeah. in school. And uh, I was petrified about dying in a nuclear war. So you can see the origins there of my work. That's a that's such an interesting thing, you know. I, I didn't. Um, I wasn't fortunate enough to experience that duck and cover um, period in the U.S. I grew up uh, overseas, and a, a little bit younger, we were sort of after the fact that you know, like, oh yeah, we're we're all gonna die anyway, so <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't bother to duck and cover. But. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and and then I moved to Texas, where we were um, just a few miles away from Pantex, where they make nuclear weapons, and so we were, you know, basically the joke there was, don't bother to duck and cover. Again, it's basically drive towards Pantex, so you can get it over with quickly. Yeah, and, uh, well, it, yeah, as, as after the age bomb, well, there was really no way to end, of course, the, with the nuclear winter, which is very, you know, all of that kind of uh, 
there was a lot of uh, talking about my work with uh, my videos is that um, is that the extinction has its kind of roots in that because people thought that uh, a nuclear winter with all that destruction would cause uh, some extinction, but there was a chance of survival. Whereas what we're going through now, what uh, uh, what what Guy has helped me to um, realize is that uh, this this is a brick wall we're hitting, and uh, and so how does how does art how does my art um, you know come to terms with it? First of all, there's not going to be anybody reading my art from yeah. you know, a not too distant future, and what is the purpose of art in that in with all that realization. So, uh, yeah, th I, I would say that Guy's influence on my art in the very recent uh, term has been uh, tremendous. I'm often told that by promoting that perspective that we're all going to die, I'm encouraging people to give up, to not do anything anymore, to just get it over with and roll over and die. Many people have accused me of contributing to people's suicides and to encouraging others to commit, commit suicide. It, obviously, you have heard my message, have paid attention, and I assume you're not going to roll over and die. So what has been the impact on you in terms of your work, in, in, in terms of your art, of this most horrible of messages? Yes, and uh, that has been something that uh, I think uh, uh, Kevin... Kevin Hester um, wanted to uh, give a shout out to Kevin. Um, great question uh, that he asked me was, uh, how do I work through my grief on this? And uh, I use my heart to work through, because I use my heart to um, kind of disassemble my world and then reassemble it um, through my imagination. And quite a, few, uh, quite a bit of my feeling is involved in that reassembly. Uh, if people want to see for instance, well, you mentioned that the, my book by Cyclopolis, which is published in France, so, so if anybody there you know, reads French and that's in France, you can get that book. Not available in the United States. Uh. But Cyclopolis uh, foresaw the extinction um, 70 years from now. Um, and after I finished the book and it went to press, um, that was when I, when you and uh, some folks like at the, the Arctic uh, blog. Uh, by the way, that was a wonderful show uh, on um, on uh, with Sam channeling Sam Carana. That was wonderful, Pauline. That was great. Uh, but that was about the time when I realized I was off in my. It was going to be a lot sooner. I think the phrase that you hear a lot now is "sooner than expected." Uh, yeah. But I think your approach is. I think people are too harsh. Uh, they don't understand what you're trying to say. I think that your term planetary hospice just describes where we should go as, uh, as we make this journey. Uh, it will first be preceded by, this is in my work, you'll see a collapse. Uh, I think we're already experiencing the, the beginnings of that. Uh, for instance, you have often said uh, that uh, these, these things that we've seen in, in like, Hollywood movies of like oceans rising and uh, and uh, you know huge events like that. That's way in the future, uh, long after humans are gone. Because, as you said, uh, habitat is the first thing. You can't live without habitat. What is the exact quote, uh, guy? What's your quote about habitat? Habitat, habitat, habitat. <laughs> I think that's my favorite quote about habitat, is we are animals, and just like every other animal, we cannot live without habitat. And that's a very difficult concept for people to wrap their minds around, because when you grow up in a city, and everything you need comes to you through some sort of store or through the water lines or whatever, then it's difficult to imagine that you need wild spaces. But you don't have to think very long about this to figure out where your water comes from. It doesn't come through the tap. It originates someplace else. Where is that someplace else? And in the case of New York City metropolitan area, there's an enormously thoughtful approach that has been taken in which the city bought a tremendous amount of area upstream and captured the water coming into the city. So that's 
recognition of the link between wild nature and how we live our lives on a daily basis, including in the cities. And I used to teach this in my classes on a regular basis as well. Well, they got tired of getting of having cholera. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that could that could be quite an incentive. Yeah. <laughs> right near the aqueduct, uh, right. the aqueduct carried that water from the aqueduct into the city. Mm -hmm. And that's where it got its origin. I have to be modest here that my work does not have any original ideas. I, I borrow or, or steal my ideas from, from usually from scientists and, and, and uh, people who write like yourself. Um, and uh, I try to, what I've been doing, uh, you mentioned my previous book, which was um, a collection of, of weekly comics called uh, Roadkill Bill. He was a frequently run over squirrel. And it was about transportation, well, a lot about the environment. And I tried to explain complex scientific ideas, um, and, and I thought that that would actually help. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I don't. I don't try to um, change anyone's mind now. But uh, back then, I did, and, and it's good work. It's still people still refer to it. Uh, it was published by Carbusters Press, um, and uh, that's there was. I was always. For, for well, for the, uh, well, quite pretty much all my life, I I love bicycling. I love walking, and not too crazy about cars. I do like to draw old cars, though. But um, <laughs> as, as Guy says, you know, civilization is a heat engine, and we have to understand that that this this goes way back. This problem of ours, our our big brain and our ability to make tools, is both a wonderful thing. And sadly, uh, it will be our destruction as well. Uh, but it's a story that can be told if you step back and just tell the story. There's wonderful people. There's wonderful things that have happened in history and quite a few things that were not so great. But it's a story. And it's that story, I think, that needs to be told. The story is about to come to an end. Um, I wish, I hope that people, more people will uh, try to be more, you know, to be creative and and delve into particularly the the feelings that we have as we go into extinction. Uh, someone just sent, recently sent me a wonderful book of poems. It's from Tom Hawkins, and uh, I. That's just another way, and I think all different ways that people can express themselves about this would be. Mm -hmm. you know, it, that's what I hope to see. Yeah. You know, you you mentioned that your work is not necessarily unique, that it draws from science and scientists, for example. Interestingly, I had a telephone conversation this morning with a performing artist, and she expressed some concern that her work was not original. And so I suggested to her that she reach out to an artist that she just discovered yesterday who is doing very similar work. Because I, you know, you can look at this from two different perspectives. Either none of us is doing anything unique because we have all been influenced by other people, or we can say every single person and the work they produce is unique because I'm not exactly the same as you, and therefore my art or my science or my craft is not, ident not identical to what anybody else would produce. So did you want to comment about that? Oh, absolutely, and since uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm also a science geek, so <laughs> <laughs> science can't exist without uh, people building, you know, standing on the shoulders of other scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be no Einstein without uh, Newton, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, it, nobody is right, and nobody's wrong. Incidentally, if, if people want to share my work, they don't even have to ask because I don't believe in copyright for that very reason. That sharing, I think, is is a human thing, and uh, you shouldn't see it as a proprietary. But I, if people want to share my artwork, um, they're welcome. If they want to do a version of what I do, uh, I'm thrilled that I've inspired them. So, um, and if someone says, "Well, I like your story. I like Naz alone. I want to write the sequel. Go right ahead." <laughs> And, and that's why, by the way, that's one reason why now I don't do um, 
books I do or, or is that when I put things on uh, YouTube and Vimeo, uh, you can see them for free. You can share them. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about, I have a lot of problems with the internet, but the sharing thing that you can see a, a video of mine for free on your phone, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased. I'd like to point out again that Ken Avador's YouTube channel is called Bicyclopolis. That's spelled the same as bicycle, except of instead of ending with an E, as bicycle does, just add opolis, as in metropolis. So bicycleopolis. That, that, that guy is the only one who's been able to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back a little bit you mentioned your books already your 2001 book Roadkill Bill wonderfully displays your work as a graphic artist the book is dedicated to your daughters and it indicates that we have quite a miserable future ahead of us even back in 2001 so can you fill us in on your thoughts as you pondered and wrote Roadkill Bill yeah Roadkill Bill was a, it's a collection of comics that I did for a weekly newspaper for like three years or so. Uh, there were stories in there, but mostly it was about, um, I felt, like I said previously, that I could explain uh, complex ideas. Uh, I'll just mention some people who, in addition to yourself, but, uh, I uh, was very much inspired by the works so of Ivan Illich, for instance, uh, Garrett Hardin, who wrote a wonderful essay called The Tragedy of the Commons, so I, I really enjoy, I think I might have sent you. <laughs> um, when Gary Harden uh, passed away, his family asked if they could use that comic on their, on their memorial website. Now it's thrilled. Oh, man, that's great. Yeah, the tra but the tragedy comments is very much uh, an inspiration for my work. And, of course, you know, other folks, the, the, all the, 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 I can't mention how many of them, climate scientists, um, paleontologists and others who have helped me to understand uh, the predicament we're in. But also there's motivations, and so there I have characters in some of my stories, complex motivations. They don't wear hat, white hats. A lot of times they're both, they're like like myself, I don't, I'm not always right. Uh, I see in myself I have, um, uh, you know, there's things about me that are not necessarily helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, contributing to the climate. I, it, although I am very critical of our car culture, I don't criticize individuals because, in large part, the people who drive very often have to drive. And that, by the way, Ivan Illich, in his book, Energy and Equities, he, he explained uh, that the, that problem, that uh, people can, how much it changes, how technology can change, um, not just... Um, you know, the the simple tool that you're using, but it changes the whole way you live. And he called that, uh, I think he called it a, a, a perfect monopoly or something like that. But that's, uh, we, we see that we're in, we're in a fix, we're in a bind that really makes the individual activity uh, choices very difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's just a few. I mean, there's many, many others. Uh, but, uh, uh, and by the way, you've had some uh, people who've informed my thinking, like Kirkpatrick himself on the show. So, uh, Thank you for mentioning Garrett Hardin, by the way, great ecologist and conservation biologist. Perhaps, uh, of course, well known for his idea of the tragedy of the commons, which he published in Science. And among conservation biologists and ecologists, he is perhaps best known, or maybe second best known, for his question, and then what? So he would pose this question, if you're going to fix problem A through this series of steps, one, two, and three, and then what? So that brings to mind any potential solution we might come up with for climate change, for example, what are the consequences of those actions? You know, so how, how much does this kind of thinking influence your work? Do you think about as you are preparing a video or as you're, as you're sketching a, a cartoon, do you think about, okay, they solved this problem, how many problems does that create on its own? Do you think about that? 
Absolutely, and, and uh, you're right, Garrett Hardin was a, a tremendous, uh, brilliant thinker about that. Uh, yeah, there's cause and effect, and I, and I think when we look at what's going on in the Arctic right now, we see that people misunderstand the whole concept of, for instance, feedback loops and, and tipping points. And they think they think in terms of linear progression instead of uh, exponential. Uh, these are important things to understand if you're going to be doing anything about it ecology or the environment it's uh everything has an effect on everything else and a lot of it is very unpredictable right one of the things i really enjoy about the videos you make and you mentioned this a, a moment ago is the characters are complex they don't just wear black or white hats and i and i, I feel like you make them more human by doing that. We we are so caught up right now with, you know, this is the right way and this is the wrong way that the creating that sort of complex character who is might be a little confused about the world around them, but they're not evil. They're just, you know, kind of trying to figure it out. Um, do you, were you inspired by um, real life people when you did that? Well, uh, uh, I think you might be referring to Maz Alone, which I think is the one video that I There are like three videos I did about near-term human extinction. But Maz, if, if people want to see how I see people working through their, uh, you know, how their, what kind of emotions they will feel as they go into that extinction, Maz Alone is the movie they should watch. Yeah. Uh, and... And yes, originally, I re uh, the, the plot of that story is about uh, some wealthy people who decide uh, that they can escape the consequences of their term human extinction. They know what's happening. They they know because they're informed. They're they're you know, they're the one percent. <laughs> right. <have> to, <laughs> to, to, to the best. Yeah. So they and they can buy islands and uh, and then they think they can wait it out or whatever. But. Um, they feel they can be disconnected, and of course, you know, no, no man is an island, and that's what they discover. Um, with that, that um, as as they themselves think that they can, they they go through a progression. I won't ruin that for you, but I have to say that uh, there was a review of it uh, somewhere, and the person said, "If you're looking, he was looking for movies about extinction. He couldn't find any except mine." Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was, it was wonderful. He said something to the effect of, "Don't ex you know, it's, I use a kind of rudimentary um, animation technique. I call it an animatic." Yes. And uh, he said that, uh, "Don't you know this? This could be expanded into uh, you know a good movie, uh, you know, like Hollywood movies. Except Hollywood movies aren't going to you know, Hollywood production companies aren't going to touch this with a ten foot pole." <laughs> and I knew that. Yeah. Nobody makes movies with unhappy endings. Um, anymore. Uh, they used to, uh, I was very much, when I was a kid, my dad was a bit of an oddball in, in many ways, loved uh, foreign movies. So he would take me to the local art house to see movies um, by, uh, you know, Italian and French filmmakers. Yeah. And they would have horrible, depressing endings where no, 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 no Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You'd, you'd have Umberto D, you know, you know, losing his little dog, and and the bicycle thief. He he becomes one. His, oh, am I ruining him? <laughs> Anyways, but <laughs> I, I can say this: uh, I am not ruining it uh, for the ending. Um, it's not a, uh, you know, I, I'm not ruining the ending by telling everyone that Mazalon, which is about near-term human extinction, does not have a happy ending. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and if people want to watch that, it's also on Bicyclopolis on YouTube. And it's it's done so well. And I love the way you voice the characters. And I love the music that you created and put in there. It's really, it's really beautifully crafted. And it's very simple. And I just, I, I watch them over and over because there's such a, there's so much thought put into it. And I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you. And I, I, I just want to mention that uh, you, you, know, you mentioned that I used to do, I don't do courtroom drawing anymore. I used to, but what I do is a lot of urban sketching. And I love sketching people uh, 
up close uh, and talk to them, and over the course of the sketching, I get to learn something about them. And uh, I don't like working from photographs, though I did do a photo. I did work from photographs for um, a guy, but that was a bit, you know, you, you, you've seen his videos enough to know everything. And the more you know about somebody, it's through in the drawing. And, um, uh, and if I, probably this would be a good time to say something about the process, which a lot of people, they, they see art and I think it's wonderful that we have so many people who are art fans, um, but it's a lot like magic. Um, for, for artists, we are made very concerned with the nuts and bolts, um, but that's not important for the viewers. We need people who view it and experience it uh, on an emotional level. And where I learned that was I had a teacher in art school, his name was Sandy Cosson, and he's still alive. Um, and he, he always said, we're not cameras. Artists are not cameras. Uh, we, we should, if we want to be successful at our craft, not draw what we see, but draw what we feel about what we see. Mm -hmm. and, and I think about that every day, every time I'm trying. Mm -hmm. I think all about the things that Sandy Costa taught me, but particularly that. And that's the most important thing that I think all those experiences that I've had in courtrooms drawing and, and uh, urban sketching, I want that experience of people, of humanity, to come through in much of my work. Uh, and that, I think Maslow is the best example of that. I absolutely agree. Yeah, that's, that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. That is uh, really important, I think, to for many artists um, I feel like that's the that's the key. That's what makes their art um, receivable by the people who go to look at it. I mean, obviously, Vincent wasn't taking a photograph. He was painting what he felt. And that is exactly what you're doing. And, that, and that's I, th I think that's why it's your art speaks to so many people. Now, I, you also have, you dedicated your book to your daughters, your um, roadkill bill. I have two wonderful daughters, yes, they're adults now. And are they also artists, or did they take a different path? Uh, they, they have been creative, uh, you know, with music and other things, but not, mm -hmm. not, not, with the, not so much the art. They can draw a little bit, but, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you, you have to respect the... The, the journey that your children take, uh, and that's part of, I think, uh, what I've learned from my children is you know, their independence of, of you know, in every way, their thinking and uh, everything else. Is, it was very important for me to have that experience, um, and I think that's helped my artwork as well. Right. You know, you mentioned that your art is not photography. And for me, at least, this distinguishes between craft and art. With a craft, you're trying to get something right, maybe even useful. With art, you're trying to evoke emotions. And I think that's an incredibly important and distinctive characteristic about art. That's what artists do, is try to make people feel. Can you comment about that a little bit? Right, and uh, as I said before, it's, it's a it's a magic thing. You know, when people go to a magic show, they don't want to hear what goes into the magic. <laughs> right. <laughs> they want they want the illusion, and uh, the illusion is important. But a really good magician, a really good performer, knows that it's it goes way beyond the craft, as you say. Um, you have to connect with people uh, in their not just their minds, but also with their their souls and their hearts as well. Yeah, that blank piece of paper can be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why uh, I tell you, one of the, you know, I don't want to bore you too much with the craft, but uh, uh, several years ago, um, one of the companies that makes paper contacted uh, my wife and I and others, other artists asking them uh, about what kind of paper we use. And if you, people look close, they'll see that I use, I use a gray-toned paper. And it's been the best thing that's ever happened because I don't work from white. That white piece of paper is terrifying. You're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're on 
kind of on the subject of perception, which is one thing that I would, you know, I'm, when, I, when it comes to science, I, I rely on other people. But when uh, but perception is something my that's my, um, and I, it's important for people to understand. And I think this is also true of science in a way. At one time, scientists were also artists. They were, you know, a poly, what is it, polymaths? Is that what they call it? Yeah. But, uh, you know, someone like, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci was everything. Right. Uh, but we've we've been we've specialized since then. But one thing that scientists I find from the science is that they know that there's always the possibility they're wrong. Mm-hmm. So we always, <laughs> as artists, <laughs> need to have that self reflection as well. But what informs my perception, my work, is knowing the background of what it is I'm seeing. And I'll give you a good example. Is like uh, when I first moved from New York, and I was a typical New Yorker in every way. Uh, very myopic. But when I moved to Minnesota uh, many years ago, uh, I saw things. I saw things that I never saw in New York. One thing, you know, like miles and miles of cornfields and soy soybeans. <laughs> I thought they were beautiful at the time, gorgeous, green, and mm-hmm. you know. But uh, I, I remember thinking, do these people out here eat that much sweet corn? And pop? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what field corn was, and I didn't know how. You know, that it was hybrid and now it's GMO and uh, that it's grown with, uh, you know, and hydrosomonia and, you know, <laughs> and chemicals. And now when I look at it, I go, oh my God, this is a factory. So it's yeah. changed the way I, knowing something, the history, what goes into something is very important for me. Uh, it helps me to understand what I'm looking at. And it's true of people. I need to know about a person before I draw them or while I'm getting to know them. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to your books. Specifically, your second book of graphic arts was published in 2017, so only three years ago. It was dedicated to your partner, Roberta. It's called Bicyclopolis, A Tale of Human-Powered Time Travel. And it represents a change in your personal perspective with regard to our future compared to Roadkill Bill. So can you talk a little bit about how that change came about and where it has you today? Yeah, that would be, uh, you know, for, for, for the folks who listen regularly to you, that, that it, 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 there's a story in there, which is, um, up to that point, I had, I thought we had a chance, and I thought there was things we could do to turn uh, the Titanic around. Um, I no longer have that uh, point of view. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was very, very traumatic for me, when, and largely it came from listening to you, um, and of course, my first impulse was, he can't be right. And, mm-hmm. But I, I did my research, which I always do, and came back to say, yeah, guy, guy was right. But the book was published, it was done. Um, and that's when I got to work on uh, first a, a, a video called uh, Countdown to Extinction. That's also on the YouTube and the video site. Um, and another one called Escape from Planet Earth. Also about people who um, escape or think they can from our problems, but... I like the, that one, it, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Magic one is, is, is the one that, 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 that has, where I've worked through all of that uh, and finally came to um, an acceptance. And I do think that within the time we have left, we, it's not a wasted time. We should you know, imagine that there's still things we can do, and I think um, we've talked about them. We can be kind to one another. We can... Mm-hmm. There's still much to learn. Um, uh, Mozart lived, he, what, 40? Um, you know, 30, we, he was in his 30s. Um, we, don't, we, we don't have to have the TV on all the time. <laughs> <laughs> learn a few things. Uh, so I, I, incidentally, I do have a, a comic about um, Mozart where he was cloned from a fingernail they found in his, it's in the book, I think, in his <laughs> robot. So they, they, they found, uh, a scientist found a fingernail of Mozart and cloned him and brought him back um, into the 21st century. Uh, and, uh, but he was too busy um, to compose anything because he had to answer his email. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, that was, a, uh, that's kind of... Um, that's a um, good one. <laughs> that's perfect commentary on our society. Oh my gosh, you know, we have so much tools at our fingertips, uh, literally, with a phone, 
and yet, um, and I hate to sound like a, an old, uh, an old uh, guy here, but uh, we don't really have the quality of what people had back then with just the rudimentary tools that they had. Yeah. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, uh, I think that uh, Ivan Illich would have a lot to say. One of my favorite stories of Ivan Illich is that he wrote about a, a short essay about uh, when he was a child, he, they took him on a ferry to visit his grandfather uh, father on an island off the coast of um, Turkey, or Yugoslavia, I can't remember which, but uh, uh, he said along with them on the ferry was something that transformed life, the life of those people. It was a megaphone. And they installed the megaphone that day in the, in the town square, which hadn't changed really in hundreds, thousands of years, but suddenly one man's voice was louder than the other. <laughs> and everything. Yeah, I highly recommend Ivan Illich. Um, he had no recommendations. He, he had nothing but criticisms for, for um, the uh, for tech, not the problems that technology caused. But uh, mm -hmm. large, largely, uh, I, he wasn't a pessimist. He was a person who just felt that um, we should work within the parameters of of our abilities, our human abilities, rather than the the uh, the, the technology, the amplification. I read one of his books, but it was a long time ago. Yes, uh, 70s. And, uh, but there are, you know, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, there, there's so many others who uh, uh, I could talk forever about. <laughs> but, um, you know, one thing I do want to mention is uh, that when I was, uh, when I was young, I, I didn't want to be an artist. I wanted to be a paleontologist. Oh, wow. Well, my father used to take us on trips up to upstate New York, where the Finger Lakes are, and mm -hmm. we would um, we would hunt for fossils. Uh, that's a they're outcroppings of rock that are 300, 400 million years old. And uh, I remember we would find these outcroppings along the side of the road. Uh, so we would park on the side of the road, the cars whizzing past at 50 miles an hour. And there was one outcropping where I, I, there was a gap between the two layers. That's what you look for, is layers of rock. And I looked between the layers, and there was a the sea floor, uh, <laughs> the coral reef from the Devonian era, and it was exactly as it was, and it looked so much like the coral reefs you see today but in the tropics, and here it was in, you know, Ithaca, near Ithaca. And I'll never forget the feeling Two feelings I had. One was, wow, I'm looking again. This is a time machine. And the other feeling I had was, the people behind me are going so fast, they can't see this wondrous thing. Yeah. We are all in our little capsules, um, you know, um, and even more now with the internet. Uh, we are so walled off in our experiences, not just from nature like that. that right. Wonderful, miraculous thing I saw. Uh, and it probably isn't there anymore because they widen the roads so more people could drive there. Ah, uh, right. But that was, a, that was an experience that, um, you know, experiences like that, but uh, we have to remember that part of it was the past that we learned from to understand our future. Mm -hmm. A lot of those species that I was looking at no longer exist because of the, uh, the end Permian extinction, which we now understand to be caused by about climate change. That's right. Well, you know, we have run out of time. <laughs> Can you believe it? That went so fast. We'll ha we have to have you on again. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you, Ken. We really appreciate your thoughts. It's a, it's a pleasure, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing more of your shows. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, everybody, just uh, go check out Bicyclopolis on YouTube. And uh, what's your what's your Vimeo channel? Uh, it's just Ken Avador. Okay. And, uh, it, it just, if, if people just uh, do a lot of Googling, they'll get to me eventually. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Happy Election Day. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to today's live show, everyone. You can catch NBL on PRN the first Tuesday afternoon of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. 
The next episode is scheduled for December 1st in the United States. Kevin and Kai will be hosting Professor Andrew Glickson to discuss his latest book, The Event Horizon, Homo Prometheus and the Climate Catastrophe. If you miss the broadcast, you can find shows in the archives at prn.fm, the Podbean, or at Stitcher. And please feel free to rate us on iTunes. Also, continue to follow The Nature Bat's last blog at guymcpherson.com for further updates, interviews, and speaking tours. You can keep current with Kevin Hester's work at kevinhester.live. Thanks again to our guest, Ken Abador, to our listeners, and also to Afrizen for his music, and to our amazing crew at PRN. Thank you so much, you guys up there. Until next time, remember the dominant culture has been very clever, but in the end... Nature bats last. I said it